How's everyone doing? All right. So we don't have a presentation up, so we're in a we're going to call it a fireside chat. Uh, we wanted to talk about the truth around longevity. My name is Rudy Naba. I'm going to be uh, doing two roles. I'm going to be moderating the conversation, but also answering some of these questions. Uh, and today we have Dr. Rafid Fadul and Mr. Adam Freed. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read some of these introductions and some of the questions here. But Dr. Fadul is actually out of DC and Miami. He's a triple board certified pulmonologist and intensive care physician with a passion for longevity medicine and health optimization. Among other leadership roles in the health tech spaces, Dr. Fadul currently serves as the chief medical advisor for Cenogenics. Mr. Adam Freed is the managing partner of Freedom Partners, a private equity and venture capital investor focused on investing in proven private companies that maximize human potential and enhance quality of life. He's also the founder of Chapter One, one community of uh, high performers committed to growth and development and human performance. And myself, I've also been with Cenogenics now uh, for uh, 15 years. We have 22 centers across the country. We actually just opened up our Miami office on the uh, east side of Coral Gables, where we focus on optimizing human performance, performance maximizing health, and reducing risk factors to, ulti to ultimately increase health span. So today, I don't know if you guys saw a chance to look at the description, but the, the field of longevity is wildly growing and new information is emerging every single day. And many consumers or many patients or anyone who's interested in maximizing their health and living a better life are commonly confused of where to start or where to dedicate their attention or what to focus on. And what we would like to do today is to really focus on some key questions to ask to identify what someone's starting point is and how they should go about maximizing their health, uh, their health span and potentially longevity. So uh, if there's any like questions that anyone has that are suitable for the question that we're gonna be going over, please feel free to raise your hand. I got these lights in my eyes so I might not catch them, so wave them around. Um, otherwise, we'll have some time after the talk uh, to answer your questions related to performance, health, longevity, and also health span. So first question, gentlemen, is uh, to kick this off, what are people looking for when it comes to longevity, and do they want to live longer? Hello? Uh, eight. Number eight. Yeah, I think uh, when people talk about longevity, there is no one answer. I think there's actually probably two. Uh, one is you know, how long you live or lifespan. And the other one is uh, living well, health span, right? So, I mean, and I think the, the goal when I think about longevity is I want to live as long as possible, but also I want to live well. I don't want to be 90, 95 years old, but not able to do the things that I enjoy, right? Like walking with friends, going for a hike, whatever. Like those are the things that uh, I think are, I mean, people should be focusing on when they think about longevity as a whole and what that really means to them. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, longevity is really about thriving, right? Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. It's about being able to live the life that you wish to live for yourself and, 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 be, enabled, and be enabled to have the capacities and capabilities to function for as long as you'd like, living the life that you wish to live for as long as you'd like to live that life. And I think one of the things that I typically see when working with patients is understanding where they, where, where they are to start and also how aggressively they need to pursue these goals. Uh, much like a investment account or a retirement account, if you start late in your savings, you need to be pretty aggressive in what you're going to be doing to then you know, maximize your return and be able to live off that. However, starting earlier, you want to put the, you know, put the pieces together and actually start to live this lifestyle, but you can do it in a more meaningful and manageable way without really uh, overstraining yourself in the process because you're getting a much earlier jump on it versus others. So with that, can you describe the difference between someone with average health, uh, someone that's not acutely sick, uh, and someone that's in peak cognitive, physical, metabolic health, and what's the difference in their experience and their functional capacity? Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a question of you know, how you wanna live, right? So if you're, uh, kind of this mediocre person. It's about like presence in the moment. It's about 
uh, you know, sucking the marrow out of, out of life, right? Really enjoying everything. And, you know, when we think about longevity, like to Adam's point, um, it's not just about like how many years do I have or even like your physical capacity. It's, it's really kind of embracing all of it, the spirituality, the, the mental health components of it. And so, you know, the, the way I look at it is that, you know, the same day goes by, the same 24-hour period for that person who's in, you know, kind of this like middle tier average health who's not thinking about these things, they're going to have that same 24 hours but, and they'll get like X amount of utility or value out of it. But the person who's optimized in the sense of they're very present, they, they've, their physical health is, is at its peak, their mental health is at its peak, and they're really kind of, you know, embracing life, they're going to live that same 24-hour day but derive significantly more value out of it. That's how I look at it. Over to you, Rudy. So, so one of the things I like to share, so um, in my role with the organization, uh, with Cenogenics, uh, in performance health, we do a battery of tests to identify someone's um, baseline, but also see what we need to improve upon. And when someone is traditionally healthy, there's the illness is not there. You know, health is commonly defined as the absence of illness. That doesn't necessarily mean someone is great or optimal. Now, when we look, I'm gonna go clinical a little bit if you guys don't mind, but you know, when we look at like our heart's function, and Dave was up here for the, for the keynote talking about um, BDNF, which actually occurs with exercise as well. We increase BDNF levels. But um, when you look at the heart you know, separately and how that function, you know, our heart's main job is to supply oxygen to our tissues, both our muscle, our fat, our smooth muscles, all of it. And the way it does that is that it needs to pump blood. So we take in air, that goes through our lungs, and then that gets into oxygenated blood, and then our heart delivers that to those tissues. Now, if someone is unfit and they have a maybe poor heart function, it's a lot harder for them to deliver that oxygenated blood to that tissue. So to respond to that, heart rate increases at rest, blood pressure increases at rest, so more of that oxygenated blood could get to that tissue. And the other piece of it is, is that your heart is working really hard to provide that to tissue that's maybe not doing a whole lot for you. So while we're here talking about mental health and uh, focusing on brain function, we also need to look at the systems that are um, integral to you know, making sure those things operate as well. If we have excess tissue that doesn't have a high like, physiologic return, specifically like if we have excess fat levels, um, our heart is working to supply that oxygenated blood to that fat tissue. So when we work with optimizing patients and they improve their fitness level, they improve their lung function, they improve their composition, their body fat tissue, you actually have less um, stuff to deliver that oxygenated blood to, so your heart works more efficiently. So when someone talks about, all right, we need to improve our resting heart rate, that's the reason. That's reserving energy, and when you, re when you preserve that energy, you actually you know, can thrive and feel better and accomplish so many more things. Great response. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so, so Adam, there are a ton of products uh, from all different companies on social media and from uh, social media influencers. How do people uh, kind of identify what's important and what they should focus on? Yeah, so as with anything in life, right, you, you get what you put in and you get what you pay for, right? There's tons of products, single point solutions, and really, at the end of the day, what you were looking for is to collect as much data and information about where we currently are so that we can create programs, design a lifestyle that, that will enhance those biomarkers and that data. And then taking that new data and those new tests and diagnostics to then modify those programs so that you're able to live the life that you wish to live. So, Regarding single point solutions, the more the better. However, what's missing in that is you have many different pieces of a puzzle, and they all come together to form a complete image of a puzzle with different areas of expertise focused on these different areas. And so, how we think about it is you really want a comprehensive solution and a team a team of people, a team of physicians, performance, you know, performance medicine professionals, and coaching to keep you in that program and to help you modify, design, and redesign these programs so that you can end up living the life that you wish to live how you want to live it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I think in general, 
you know, I heard someone say this term once that uh, we're living in the society in the, in the time of info obesity. And I was like, oh, that's really good because we're like overwhelmed with, with data. Some of it is just frankly bullshit, right? And so how do you sift through it is really the question. And uh, I think there's probably two answers. Um, I, when I see these like, you know, news articles or, uh, you know, releases about uh, new studies that come out, um, those are triggers for me to like go and investigate myself. And I encourage everyone here, like, go do a critical appraisal. Look at the data. Look at the, the, the patient population it was studied on or the, the test subjects. And then it kind of extrapolate out from there, assuming you guys have, like, a scientific background for it. Um, but if you don't, I think the other idea is you, you should align yourself with um, thought leaders that, you know, you do trust, right? So, um, and, and again, like, my, my bias is that there are no, you know, if someone tells you, like, here's the silver bullet to, to live longer or live better, and it's, you know, and you can buy it for X amount of dollars, it's a bunch of bullshit. I'll just tell you right now, right? Like, to do, to really be a healthy person and expand your health span, expand your lifespan, it's, it's not like a, there is no, you know, panacea pill for that, right? It's, it's a comprehensive approach. So I think you find that, that comprehensive thought leader and you align with them. And then, again, to the extent that you can, you have to critically appraise the data. To add to that, you know, marketing is, Incredibly powerful. I mean, you know, marketing budgets of organizations are so extreme at times. And it's not that the individual solutions don't work and people are just marketing snake oil, but it's just that the importance in putting that like all into one piece is, is not how we operate. Um, you know, one, one thing, whether it be curcumin or, you know, psychedelics or Hooperzine A or, you know, testosterone, whatever it may be. Those are single point solutions that may have some cascade effect and some more some, uh, some indirect effect into other things. But looking at trying to optimize longevity and health span and how well you live and reducing your risk for disease, it's a comprehensive approach. So everything from the exercise element to the nutritional element to the sleep element to the mental health element. Uh, going back to Dave, you know, talking about um, you know, longevity and just chilling out and you know, calming down and not being stressed out, not having that fight or flight response. You know, so many people are in the hunt for longevity and, you know, reading books like Blue Zones and I need to eat the Okinawa diet, but I'm still going to live the life I live, you know, in tech San Francisco. Um, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's about the behaviors that we see in these populations that is the most impactful. And those behaviors incorporate all of those elements from the sleep to the stress management and everything else with exercise, nutrition. I mean, the list goes on. Hey, there's, one thing I, there's one thing I'd add to that. We often forget that products and supplements are just that, right? They're meant to supplement a good foundation, right? As, a, as human beings, we, we look for the quick fix, right? And there are, there are certain things that have shorter feedback loops where you can lose 30 pounds in you know, a month or two. Most things are meant to, to supplement a good foundation, and it's that good foundation that re we require diagnostics, data, and information to figure out what that personalized foundation and plan looks, like, looks for you. So to, to piggyback off of that, um, there's so much access. Um, you know, maybe you know, if someone's first getting interested in optimizing their health and doing these advanced testings, um, no relationship here, but you know, the book Outlive by Peter Atiyah just you know, blew up the um, optimal health and, and preventative wellness uh, world. You know, so many people are now being exposed to things like DEXA scan, uh, excuse me, DEXA scan, VO2 max. Dave talked about a brain EEG that's also highly accessible to the consumer. With so much access now provided, I mean, Dr. Fadul, how do you, why, why do you think that maybe the public health is still going in the other direction? You know, when we look at the, the mass collective public health, we tend to trend in a direction more of disease management and not necessarily getting the root cause. But all of this stuff is now more readily available to consumers that have the interest. Yeah, I think, um, so uh, USPSTF, right, United States Preventive, uh, Preventive Services Tax Force, that, that's who sets the guidelines for like when you get your mammograms, when you get colonoscopies. When they make those things, it's not meant for like you or you or you. It's, it's meant for like the entire population, right? So yeah, the, the, and it's, it's generally speaking pretty reactive as opposed to like proactive. Although some screenings are obviously inherently uh, proactive, but you know, the reality is a lot of these things, uh, there's, there's no one answer, but there's, it's, in my mind it's multifactorial. 
and part of it is like the way our system is. It truly is a sick care system, not a health care system. It's like, I, 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 I'm, I, I sadly say that fact. It's a reality that I wish wasn't true, but it really is. 90% um, of the, the, the patients I see in the intensive care unit are, they're there because of things that are self-inflicted or completely avoidable, right? And so um, we have to, like, in order for this to actually make it mainstream in my mind and for public health to really shift, you know, First of all, the price points have to come down, um, and then we as a, the medical community have to embrace it more, right? So the reality is, and this is well, unfortunately, also well proven, that it takes seven years from the time a, uh, a therapy is approved for it to actually make, make its way into mainstream practice. Seven years, right? That, yeah, true story, unfortunately, right? So like, bill comes out today, seven years before it really gets significant traction. Yeah, you're, yeah, there's a lot of people who are already dead by that time, <laughs> exactly right. So um, that needs to change. We have to start being more cognizant and embrace new opportunities as they come out. And, you know, frankly, like public health is tied to the payer system, right? So CMS, you know, Optum, United Healthcare, all of these big payers need to actually get behind this as well. So without those things happening, it's, it's going to be for the select few who pay out of pocket, right, which is unfortunate. But... At least the, the one value of that is that it's setting a tone for what good looks like when it does get to the masses. Yeah, what I'll add to that is, right, the divergence, you know, is really due to several variables. One, with, which Raf had mentioned, uh, is our healthcare system is focused on sick care. It's very simple, right? You are presumed fine until you come into the office not fine. Right? The equivalent would be never brushing your teeth and going to the dentist once your teeth are rotten and are about to fall out. It's silly. Like, it's just pure silliness. Um, the second is, is education. Right? It's educating ourselves in the areas of our health and our body. Right? The, the, we're going we're to jump into, I think, diagnostics and the importance of diagnostics. But it's, again, data information provides choice. You want, to, you want to absorb and collect as much data and information that you can so that you can apply this information, have choice for the lifestyle you wish to live for yourself. Um, so really, the healthcare system naturally is embedded around sick care, and B, the lack of education that we have and how to be good stewards of our own health, and also not trying to do it ourselves, right? There's this whole movement around biohacking, and it's like the do DIY. Take this pill, do that thing, ice bath for 15 minutes, red light therapy for 10 minutes. These solutions may provide some, be some benefit, but if you're looking for longevity and to live a healthy lifestyle, and to live for as long as you wish to live, doing all the things that you wish to live. It's again, it's about bringing on a coach and a team of experts who can guide you through the understanding of this data and information and then create programs, design programs, and redesign those programs when you have new information, be it monthly, quarterly, yearly, to see how you're progressing and if there are other additional new diagnostics that come out that can tell us more information about ourselves, our organs, our, our cellular fluid, our intracellular fluid, our DNA, our genomics, on and on and on. Collect as much data and information and bring on a team of people who can help you understand that and design programs for you. I think that really speaks to the evolution of the DIY kind of biohacking, you know, kind of pioneers or mavericks is that those are early adopters, and then we also had physicians in the field that were early adopters and actually developed and cultivated programs where all of this testing was now incorporated to establish like what path needs to be uh, followed by this individual that's trying to accomplish these goals. So it's a much more educated and data-driven way to optimize health. So you're not losing uh, time and energy by going maybe down the wrong path that's not applicable to you. You guys are both talking about personalization versus population management. So I totally agree. So I guess uh, to that question, so, so what would you define as personalized medicine? 
Uh, I mean, that, <laughs> it's kind of a shame because that's what it should always look like. But personalized medicine is a lot of what Adam said, right? Like, I'm looking at you specifically, your variables, and really your psychology, right? Because if, I'm, if I want you to have some behavior change, I have to know what levers to pull with you because there is no one size fits all, right? You know, the, the, the carrot on the stick is very different for different people, right? So um, personalized medicine to me is, is like a tight feedback loop that's customized to you. Like the plan that I come up with for you should only be relevant to you, right? Like that's, I know your data, I know your goals, right? Like we're in a shared decision-making relationship, right? And that's what good looks like when it comes to medicine. Frankly, it should be like that for everything, right? In every, in every field of medicine. But um, when it comes to longevity in particular, because there is no, there's many, many paths to the top of the mountain. Most of them involve like good behavior change. In fact, I would say all of them do actually, right? Uh, but for all the other variables, you know, that's what, that's what personalization is about, right? Like, let's have that conversation. Let's talk about the risk benefits and alternatives. And, and let's come together to a plan that you can actually stick to, right? So if I give you, I don't know, like some crazy, not you because you actually can do all these things. Like if I, if I give you like a crazy workout and say you have to do this for like three hours a day, you're not gonna fucking do it, right? Like more, more often than not, patients aren't gonna do it. So you have to you know, meet them where they are and that's, that's what it is, right? Like how do you make sustainable change? I'll, I'll add to that. Um, it's really about tailored solutions, right? Tailored solutions designed specifically for you, right? I'll take a slight detour for a moment and, and share a personal story, right? So I'd, I'd say I was fortunate enough, you know, at 12 years old, uh, to have a health crisis where my prognosis was that by age 30, I'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Well, I'm, I'm 39 in two weeks. Uh, and what I learned from this was that subtle variations within your body can create wildly different outcomes from person to person. And so, you know, even, even, to, even recently, I uh, got additional, additional diagnostics as I continue this journey of collecting more and more data on myself. And even recently discovered that my body does not do a great job at cleaning up oxidation, which is a root cause of cardiovascular disease and degeneration of the brain. So having this information now provides me with choice. I can choose to have programs designed for me that I can then change my lifestyle so that these risk factors are just that, risk factors. And I can live the life I wish to live where these proteins or these genes are not activated. So it's living that lifestyle designed for programs, having that information to then live the life that I want to choose to live for myself. Got it. So, um, so I'm going to add one quick thing and I'll open up to questions. So, so my take on the personalized medicine is that, again, you focus on what's truly unique and what's going to be most beneficial to you. So if we're here to optimize longevity and cognitive function and so on, we need to see what our inherent risk factors are. You know, if someone comes in to our, one of our facilities and we understand that they have, you know, pancreatic issues, maybe have a, a bad fasting insulin or they're pre-diabetic with their hemoglobin A1C, we know for them, like, we need to be aggressive in restricting certain foods, specifically in this case, carbohydrates. And we know that that person needs to uh, burn through their higher blood sugar levels with certain types of exercise. Now, that's gonna then drive up their brain function that we measure on EEG. If someone's just relying on social media and you know, books and things that are attracting their attention, they may think that it's you know, curcumin or fenugreek seed that's gonna save them, when really, this is a low-hanging fruit that they just have not identified. So one of the things that we, we really focus on is identifying what those risk factors are, identifying that baseline, and then working with those behaviors and that unique individual to then put that practice into play and apply that over time so we can really mitigate that risk and, and thrive to Adam's point. Uh, we don't have anything up, but we do have, if you're in Miami, we have a Miami office that we just opened. We have 21 other centers across the country. Uh, we're pretty much in every major metropolitan area. Uh, so if anyone has interest, you know, please feel free to come up. You know, we can talk after this, like, this uh, discussion. 
Uh, we have multiple programs, everything from, you know, whether it be targeted weight loss or complete comprehensive performance plans, but also a la carte testing that's really beneficial for individuals that do want to start to tap in and learn more about themselves. Um, we have two and a half minutes. I wanted to open it up to any questions. Questions? Oh yeah. I have like three. Okay, my question is, author, you can take a shot out of it. Um, what do you think is the secret to longevity? Go to their go to their center. Yeah, come on up, man. <laughs> Uh, I, to be honest, I really, you know, I could just say there's, there's no secret to longevity. It's a culmination of many things, which would be true. But honestly, in, in going a little bit deeper, it would be mindful, like being mindful around what your inherent risks are and being mindful of all the different therapies, treatments, and uh, strategies that could be implemented. It's a tough thing to do alone. Um, it's a better thing to do with like a clinical care team that has the training within this field so that again, you, you, you get the information that's critical to you. Um, so it's, it's anything and everything, but it all starts with just having awareness around it. Around, you know, if I put you on a VO2 max test and you're huffing and puffing and gasping for air and you're in the lowest quintile, which would put you at the highest risk for cardiovascular disease and a, a early mortality. After that test, you're gonna be like, well shit, like I gotta do something about it. You may, walk a five block, you know, down to a restaurant instead of, you know, taking an Uber. Or, you know, when you go to order food, you may order food that's a little bit, you know, better for you and lower in calorie and higher in protein, more in fiber, just because you have that conscious awareness now around how shit some of your numbers are. Um, so I think that that mindfulness, you know, is important because many people were distracted. We don't know where we stand. We don't know what our risk factors are. We don't think about it. We're fine just eating anything and doing whatever with our time and you know, not spending time on things that are beneficial to us because we're just unaware. So mindfulness is a big one. What I, what I add to that is we're at such an interesting time now, right, with advancements in sensors, right, the ability to collect data, store data, and then with the, with, you know, with the evolution of um, predictive algorithms and artificial intelligence, like we're at such an interesting point in this market today where not only can you collect this data, you can store it, analyze, predict things, and build programs that are then, you can then design and redesign that will deliver tailored solutions for you and what your risk factors are and what your diagnostics uh, tell you or tell you and your care team, right? So again, don't forget that there is no quick fix. There are things that may help you with one thing or the other. But in order to have a comprehensive solution, you need exactly a comprehensive solution, which is built on a strong foundation. And if you aren't sure what a strong foundation entails, right, that's where, it's, that would be the starting point of having, you know, as we mentioned, a clinical care team to provide that insight and help you understand at least base knowledge of what are the things based on your data and information that you should be focusing on as your, part of your core foundation and then build from there. I'll be real brief because I think we're over and they're, they're flashing the light at me here. Um, if your question is about like where, you know, what interventions specifically have data, there's several that, that on a cellular level or on a macro level have some, that they have data that supports their impact on longevity and we can extrapolate to quality of life, right? Um, but it, I would actually kind of lean towards what Rudy said, right? The, he said mindfulness, my, my word is intentionality, right? Because um, all that stuff, the, one, the data points that I was just mentioning, those are all like the icing on the cake. But the cake, the cake is the behavior change, right? It's, it's reducing stress in your life, uh, building community, doing, you know, optimizing your physical strength, optimizing like the fuel that we put in our bodies, right? Like we wouldn't put like shit gas into a Ferrari, but we, we put shit fuel into our bodies all the time, right? So really that, that's the core of it. And then all these other interventions, like we can nerd out about this afterwards. Happy to talk to you about you know, the data for all these things. But those are all just the icing on the cake. I'll shut up there because we're getting the look. No, don't ever shut up. I love this stuff. Mindfulness, everything you guys are saying are amazing. Let's give applause to these three kings. Woo!